was murdered on picket lines, everybody who was in prison. And I want proper revenge, and that's the bringing about of a socialist society. Thank you very much for that, John. Uh, well. Well, uh, I don't know pigeon speeches, but uh, certainly a difficult act to follow, as they say. Um, I know John, a number of years, and Chris, and uh, particularly during the miners' strike, the biggest battle that we had in Britain since the 1926 general strike. But I think uh, it is true to say that uh, we will never forget and we will never forgive on the basis of what has happened to our people, the working class people of this country. And of course, Thatcher epitomized capitalism in the raw. She expressed vividly the crisis of British capitalism and how it was going to be resolved at the expense of the working class. In fact, she said in 1979 that her task was to make Britain great again, to restore the power of British capitalism on a world scale. Of course, uh, Britain in 1979 had seen the end of a Labour government of Callaghan, Jim Callaghan, which incidentally was brought to power in 1974 after the miners' strike of that year, which brought down the Heath government Again, the first time in British history that the trade unions have brought down an elected government. And uh, clearly, the Conservative Party and the leaders of the Conservative Party wanted to wreak revenge for that particular humiliation, as well as restore, as they saw it, the position of British capitalism. They always say, well, you know, Thatcher was brought to power because of the working class itself was in a state of, well, the winter of discontent in 1979, which apparently brought down the Labour government and prepared the way for Margaret Thatcher. And in fact, what the winter of discontent illustrated was the discontent itself with the Labour government had been brought to power. In 1974, that was the height of a struggle that took place over the previous three years. It was the biggest movement in Britain since the 1920s. Factory occupation, strikes, day in and day out. And the reason being that the working class was under attack, massive inflation, living standards were falling, and they had to fight in order to preserve what they had. And as a result, there was a mass movement on the industrial front, which then began to express itself on the political front, which brought to, go to power the Labour government of Wilson and Callaghan. And they gave promises. They wanted to give out reforms. And they started on the basis of reforms. But unfortunately, the Labour government, as all Labour governments have done, instead of using their position to change society, they've always used it to reform capitalism. And once they began to reform capitalism, they were dictated to by the laws of capitalism. And as capitalism itself is run for profits and profitability, then the whole policy was to try and prop up the profits of British capitalism to try and make it work. But in doing so, they had to attack the working class itself. Not because they were nasty people necessarily, because that was the laws of how capitalism worked. And then we saw um, the hopes that were there in 1974. And that was we've got a Labour government, it's going to act in our interests, as, as, as said it's going to introduce reforms, but as soon as it got into power, it then began to bow the knee to capitalism. It was a threat by the capitalists that that government should carry out the policy 
that it dictates and not with the policy that was elected upon. And as a result, you had the IMF being called in, you had wage restraint being imposed on the working class, and workers had to fight the Labour government. The, the, fire, the firefighters in 1979. In 1978, you had the Ford workers going on strike. In other words, the people who put the Labour government in power were forced to fight the Labour government because of the countermeasures it was now introducing. And that was the, the epitome of the winter of discontent. The low-paid workers who were suffering the most had their backs against the wall and were trying to fight for justice against a Labour government, which, yes, resulted in what? Disillusionment, demoralisation amongst our people. After all, surely a Labour government elected by us would carry out our interests. And as a result, you had this, yes, winter of discontent, demoralisation. Thatcher then was able to come to power in 1979, promising to restore the position of British capitalism. And uh, we saw within the space of two to three years, unemployment rocketed from 1.5 million to over 3 million. She presided over the biggest destruction of manufacturing industry that we've seen. 20% was destroyed. We always we said at the time that uh, Thatcher's did done more destruction than the Germans did in the Second World War. And that had a, a ring of truth about it. And there was an enormous offensive against the labour movement. But at that time, things were falling apart. The biggest recession, growth in unemployment, a lot of uh, discontent in the population. In fact, we saw it afterwards, we didn't know it at the time. Thatcher in 1981-82, which were in so much difficulties at that time, they were threat she threatened to resign at that moment to show that she was on the rocks. But Labour was up in the opinion polls. Unfortunately, what cut across it, as we know, was the Falklands War in 1982 was then they were able to fly the flag of patriotism and so on, of kind of mobilise the backward workers, mobilise the middle classes to support the re-election of Margaret Thatcher. And when that re-election took place in 1983, then the gloves came off. Then there was an attempt then to, to really change the whole situation by introducing anti-trade union legislation to undermine picketing, undermine uh, the basis of uh, strike action and so on, in preparation for taking on the miners. And the reason why Thatcher took on the miners was because of, they represented the heavy battalions of the British working class. They, they were victorious in 72, victorious in 74. They carried out solidarity action when nurses went on strike. They were looked up to as this leading layer of the working class movement. And therefore, if you could undermine the miners, not only would be repaying the revenge of 1972 and 74, but then they could cow the rest of the working class itself. Defeat the miners, then they thought they'd defeat working people. And after Thatcher was re-elected, in 1983, after the victory in the Falklands, she believed that she could in, should repeat the victory of an industrial Falklands and smash the miners and prepared the way for that. You know, uh, they brought on uh, Ian McGregor, who came over from America, who first of all headed the British Steel Corporation, and they, within nine months they provoked a strike. And half the workforce of the steel industry was sacked as a result. And he was taken from steel and put as the national uh, chairman of the British Coal Board in order to prepare the same thing, but in the coal industry. And all the strategy of the ruling class at that time was to weigh up how they could defeat the miners, how they could make the police force a national police force, how they could manipulate social security benefits, and all the things are put into play in order to try and take them on. As, uh, as was said by John and others, that they even falsified the books, if you like, to, to ensure 
the book the pits were seen as uneconomic and therefore the scene was set for an onslaught the biggest class battle you've had in Britain since 1926 and the only problem was so they could have said yeah that the miners were defeated they thought Thatcher thought they would defeat the miners in a matter of weeks but on the contrary it stiffened the miners stiffened the mining areas why because they knew it was a question not of wages that is defense of jobs and the community if they went down everything would go down and therefore we would say that these areas rose to the occasion and particularly the miners wives I would say that those who never played any role at all in trade unionism in the past or politics or whatever they rose to the occasion and the miners strike went on for 12 months unbelievable and it showed therefore the, the tenacity that was there the prepared the prayers for fighting all the way if need be was there but we know it wasn't the lack of resolve of the miners that, that led to the situation but it was the, the lack of resolve of the leadership of the British labor movement and I agree with John and that that there's lots to be learned from the Thatcher period because we know that we had also other struggles in the 1980s which are a bit different we had for instance the battle in Liverpool led by the militant Labour Council which was elected in 1983 and the policy was no cuts no attacks on working people the government has robbed us of hundreds of millions of pounds because they, they cut the money from the local authorities we demand that back and we will wage a campaign of civil disobedience in Liverpool and we'll take it to the rest of the country to defeat the mining, to defeat the, the Thatcher government if need be and uh, they got concessions on the basis of a militant struggle unfortunately you compare that to today where Labour councils in a scandalous fashion have been prepared to accept and carry out the cuts of the coalition government Liverpool refused to do it and as a result was able to make um, not only built not only by this was not out in the tops the whole of Liverpool rallied to the, the cause of the council itself why because they could they first of all built 5,000 council houses at a time when Thatcher was cutting back on council houses they created 2,000 jobs through job creation and they also increase the facilities on health on education and other social facilities in the city in other words workers saw them fighting back and uh, all Liverpool uh, did was to well we've shown what can be done we call on all Labour councillors to do the same and other councillors were attempting to get around their problems by increasing the rates in other words people should pay for their the services were increasing the money or burden upon them and we said no but they wanted to increase rates but Thatcher then came back and said hang on we're going to rate cap all the local authorities so that put an end to that and we said okay let's have a united front of all labour authorities against the rate capping which happened in 1985 30 labour authorities including Ken Livingston, Margaret Hodge and all the others, Blunkett and Kinskin Cole, were all for it. Yes, yes, we're going to oppose the, the, the Thatcher government. And on the, on the 11th hour, they all capitulated and left Liverpool isolated and also of Lambeth itself. And as a result of that, they surcharged those councillors in Liverpool. They didn't, they, every single councillor, the, the brave 47 won all the elections that they, they had in fact the labor vote was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and in fact if you look at the vote in 1987 where thatcher again won the election in 1987 the biggest swing to labor throughout the whole of the country was in liverpool and it's because they stood up and fought for the working class militancy pays they said we will not give in to the pressure of the Thatcher government and as a result the, they stepped in 
The government, the, the establishment, who are now praising Thatcher to, to heaven, or high heaven, they're the ones who stepped in and surcharged all those 47 councillors by a team of £7,500 each. They were fined, in other words, and debarred from office. They were taken out. Not because of the electorate, in fact, the electorate supported them, but because of the Thatcher government and, I would say, the failure of the Labour leaders. And I think we have to understand it's not a one way street here where Thatcher is the, is, is, the, is the main enemy. She was the main enemy. But she could have been defeated. She could have been easily defeated if the Labour leadership had been up to the task. Unfortunately, they weren't in, interested in this. Neil Kinnock, God rest his soul, when he uh, dies, I tell you, he's the one who came forward and said, Dented Shield. We can't afford to take on the Tories in a, in a confrontation. We must have to cut the, carry out the cuts in the best way we can. Dented Shield policy. The same thing they're doing at the present moment up and down the country, which means carrying out the cuts for the coalition government itself. And of course, as far as Liverpool is concerned, they attacked the Liverpool councillors and undermined their struggle because they didn't want to see militancy pay. These were the great moderates who then attempted to fix all Labour Party policy on any left-wing programme. And, well, what they went and did was a, what they call a prone cocktail offensive in the city of London, where they had, uh, you know, different uh, celebratory drinks and so on with big business to win them over to the Labour Party, this new Labour Party that was going to ditch the militants. Of course, you had the, the witch hunts, and the expulsions of militant and others in the 1980s because of the stand that we were taking in order to make the Labour Party acceptable to capitalism. That was the whole idea. That they wanted to drive out not just militant, but the left itself. Because some of these lefts didn't need driving out, they just jumped ship and became right-wingers. And we saw that then with the emergence. Talk about Thatcher's heir. Well, Thatcher said that the heir was Tony Blair. He's the man, he's the man who's, the, who's, who's, who's also the continuation of the Thatcher policy of making capitalism work, which means at the expense of the working class. It can't be done in any other way. And that's why we saw the continuation of privatisation. We saw the continuation of the anti-trade union laws. We saw the ditching of clause for the socialist aspiration of the Labour Party. And Blair wanted to break the links with the trade unions as well. In other words, he wanted the Labour Party, who say, he said, he wished it never had been created in the first place. He said, Labour really should become more like the Tories. And that's what he uh, bent over and attempted to do. In other words, continue where Thatcher had started to, to emasculate the working class movement, if you like. And of course, in the trade unions, you also had new realism, class collaboration. Well, after the defeat in 1926, you had that philosophy, and that's what the same in the 1980s. And the trade union leaders like Norman Willis and so on epitomised this particular trend, class collaboration. We can't strike. The working class is too weak. The working class doesn't exist. We therefore have to bow down to the market. And that was the philosophy of the trade union leaders, the labour leaders. And that's why we're in the mess we are at the present time. The working class has suffered a counter-revolution. Let's be clear about it. Compared to what we were before, the job security is gone. Staff levels are through the roof. You know, two days ago they had a report about zero hour contracts, which has been rapidly rising. In other words, you're going back to Victorian times. In fact, that's what Thatcher wanted. She praised Victorian values to make Britain great again. And of course, the way they did it was to smash British industry, because they weren't interested in investing, and rely on services, banking, financial services, property speculation, and all the rest of it. That's the reality you have at the moment. This is the mess we got at the moment. That's why British capitalism is very weak and feeble, as we saw by the crisis, the last crisis where it was affected more than any other major capitalist powers itself. Therefore, the whole struggle must be, as, as was explained, yes, to fight 
for a trade union movement that represents the interests of the working class. And let's give this, you know, let's give due to the struggle of the miners of Scargill and so on. They were prepared to fight to the end. And others were prepared to uh, stab them in the back, like over whopping and the doctors and all the other sections. There's, there's a lot of crimes against the working class. But we learn the lessons of that. We need leaders in the movement who will not capitulate as the capitalism of class collaboration. We have leaders who are prepared to lead and to base themselves on the aspirations of the working class people for a better life. And that means to fight in that kind of way to the end, to the bitter end, not only in the trade unions, but also in the Labour Party. I think the United is correct. The Labour Party was built for the working class. It came out of our suffering, our sacrifices, but have been taken over by these creatures, the Kinnocks and the Blairs and all the other tripe that's up the top who now use it in their own career models, who are not interested in socialism because they have made their peace with capitalism, responsible capitalism, says so uh, Ed, uh, Ed, whatever his name is, Christ, it's responsible. What the hell does that mean? Capitalism is there for the exploitation of the working class. Responsible or not, that doesn't come into it. And if you accept capitalism, you will accept the very logic of capitalism. That's what past Labour governments have done, and that's why they failed. And unfortunately, if Labour goes down this road again, they will also fail in those circumstances. But I think workers are fed up now. We're fed up to the teeth. And I think this backlash about that is an indication of the mood that's developing in society. People are pissed off. People are about to get full. And, and this is just simply antagonise them more, in my opinion. And Paul hopefully will, and I will do, there's talk now the TC organised a one-day general strike. First time since 1972, they've actually talked about it. First time since 1926, they've actually done it. And that's the kind of mood change that exists in Britain and throughout Europe and the world for that matter. So the idea of socialism, yes, is not dead and buried with Thatcher. But on the contrary, it's been revived on the basis of events and the crisis of capitalism. And we need, yes, a leadership that's prepared to carry through to the end and a policy that is, to take over the major monopolies in Britain, the banks, insurance companies, and the workers' control and management, plan the economy in the interest of working people. Then you can abolish unemployment. Then you can build houses. Then you can give people a future. But under capitalism, there is no future. You can see what happened in Greece. You can see what's happening in Portugal. That's our future in Britain if we continue on the road of capitalism. And therefore, we... Yes, celebrate this event insofar as it brings a crowd together. It reaffirms our ideas about what went wrong under the last Labour government of the, of the trade unions failed to act when they should have acted. And it means we have to change those organisations, not create new ones, change them, put fighters in their place who will struggle for the working class itself. It's been done before, it can be done again, but this time there's no going back because this time. The crisis is too serious, and therefore we should pledge ourselves on this solemn occasion, as they say, to rededicate ourselves, yes, to an end to Toryism, to, to blue Toryism. I think that's the word they've given for this, this circus that's going to happen now. An end to that, an end to capitalism in the raw, an end to capitalism at all, and the bringing about a, of a new society for us, for working people, for Christ's sake. We create the wealth, we want the wealth. Not, as, not these parasites who are dominating us. In that way, we have something to look forward to. And that's the way the message, I think, from the commies on the platform, from the, the heroes who have stood up to, to Thatcherism over the last 30 years of Blairism, we rededicate ourselves to them and say we will carry on the fight to ensure that we get to that measure of socialism and the, the happiness, yes, I use the word, the happiness and future for young people and older life.